Hello there, you're watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. In the next half hour or so, we'll see what's making the headlines with The Guardian columnist Zoe Williams and the chief executive of Conservative Home, Mark Wallace. Lovely to see you both. As ever, though, to the front pages, uh, starting with The Times, which says the government is accused of killing off overseas travel following summer holiday rule confusion. The Metro splashes on the global police investigation, which has seen Brits among the 800 held and hordes of money and cocaine discovered. On the front page of The Eye, fresh rush to get jabs raises hopes for an end of lockdown. Ministers hope a Glastonbury-style rush for appointments among the under-30s will limit the delay in lifting restrictions. The Guardian leads with the Chancellor Rishi Sunak being open to a four-week delay to lockdown easing. Meanwhile, Andrew Lloyd Webber says he's willing to be arrested should the government try to delay lockdown being lifted on June the 21st. That's the lead story for The Telegraph. Outrage as Oxford students vote to axe the Queen. The Daily Mail reporting the students find her portrait represents colonial history. The Financial Times reports that just days after the G7 countries agreed a new tax system for the biggest, most profitable multinational companies, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, wants an exception for big city banks. And the Daily Star has an interesting take on the space race between billionaires Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos on its front page. Yes, there you have it. Um, so, The Guardian columnist Zoe Williams, the chief executive of Conservative Home, Mark Wallace, are here. Welcome to both of you. Lovely to see you. Um, so, where are we at is kind of the question, isn't it? And what will happen next week on decision day for, for June the 21st? Um, the Metro, um, talking about Freedom Day, which is how the government chooses to describe that day, June the 21st, is in doubt as the North West faces tougher measures um, the question now is rising hospitalizations. What happens next? Zoe, what's your assessment? So I've been keeping a really close eye on this because my brother-in-law is meant to be getting married on the 26th of June. And it has been pretty clear for the last eight days, I would say, that the government has been drip feeding to the Sun and the Mail in particular, does the hunch that Freedom Day wouldn't happen or it would be delayed by two weeks. Um, it's quite surprising, I think, to find The Guardian leading with Sunak saying he was open to a four-week delay because he's obviously... There's certainly no way they would have got news from his camp without his say-so. So he's obviously trying to get an alternative narrative out so that when Freedom Day actually is delayed, he doesn't get all the... You, you, he's not seen as the hawk who's trying to get Freedom Day maintained as the 21st of June. I mean, bear in mind that Sunak has been seen as the person who's always been anti-lockdowns, who's always been economy first. And whether or not that's fair or not, it's always been seen as him versus Hancock, with Hancock worried about infection numbers and Sunak worried about the economy. Um, so I think it's pretty clear all the signals are going, th this lifting of lockdown, this final moment isn't going to happen. What I think remains to be seen is whether the in Delta variant numbers are so worrying that the amount of lockdown we've already had eased actually gets rolled back. And I think probably that's where the next the, the attention will go, rather than whether or not we open up on the 21st of June. It, it, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, to see what's going to happen and the factors that are playing into this, uh, Mark. I know the data journalist, renowned for the FT, suggesting now that hospitalisations are beginning to follow the same pattern as the autumn wave, something we don't want to see. The question is whether deaths then don't, because the cases are largely among younger people. All of this playing into um, what the government does next. Uh, again, same question to you. What is your assessment of what might happen? Well, ultimately, it all comes back to that famous phrase, data, not dates, which the government said was going to be its approach. I think I, I remember coming on this show to argue at the time that they ought to be a bit more transparent up front with exactly what measures of data they were talking about. But right now, even if even looking at, say, I think John Byrne Murdoch is the, the data scientist, who, the data analyst from the FT you're referring to, lots yeah. of other people who are producing public analysis really for the first time in a crisis like this, that you can access um, online that's transparent, you can see what's happening. It's a question of working out exactly what measures 
um, tell us uh, what what kind of stage we're at in this potential um, extra wave. And that's partially, as you say, about case numbers. It's partially about to what extent is the strength of the link still there despite vaccination between case numbers and hospitalizations. And then it's about, of course, what, what a hospitalization at this point in the pandemic means in practice and most acutely is there still that link as closely between hospitalizations and death rates but also of course how long is somebody in hospital for what is the threshold at which people are being admitted to hospital and as you as you mentioned if you're talking because of the vaccination uh program success as seems to be the case that a lot of this growth in cases is happening among younger people to what extent does that mean that we're, we're, going, we're going to see different outcomes or the health, the pressure on the health service is different? Um, of course, what that all feeds to ultimately is, I, I don't think it's quite as Zoe, uh, quite to the point that Zoe said yes, um, in that it's not just about rolling things back. The question is, what delay might there be if there, if there is a delay? How long would it be for? And of course, again, data, not dates. What would the conditions have to be to eventually uh, carry out that further unlocking? Yes, as we, let's look at the eye as we talk about um, this next bit then, Zoe. This fresh rush to get jabs, raising, the, raising hopes for an end of lockdown, um, described, described as a Glastonbury-style rush for jabs, which, I mean, for, for government is heartening to see, but how much is the government prepared to sacrifice the young in respect just of getting COVID, the prospect of long COVID, in order to stick to its dates and all the bits that that matters for. Hospitality, the big events, you know, whether it's the Hampton Court Flower Show or the, or the Euros. I mean, there is, there's still a lot at stake, isn't there, for the economy here? Well, the, well, the, the threat to the young is really twofold because they're in the active economy, you know, in a, in a sense. Obviously, as you mentioned, they might get long COVID even if they don't become hospitalised or get seriously ill. But they are also the people holding down the jobs in hospitality and events and entertainment and, you know, the general kind of business of the nation. And if those jobs disappear for another season... They, they, that, that is an extraordinary hit to this generation. So the decisions made around their health are not straightforward and their health isn't the only thing that matters. You, well, obviously health is the only thing that matters, but they, they, their health outcomes have to be balanced against their outcomes in, you know, launching themselves into the world. Obviously, there are all the talk, and I think this is really instructive to remember, we were talking so much about vaccine passports and how unfair that would be on the young because they hadn't had a chance to be vaccinated yet. And the, the old for whom so much had been sacrificed were getting their passports and going on holidays when the young who hadn't been vaccinated and didn't have the money to go on holiday anyway were being thrown to the wolves. It is very heartening to see that they've reached the front of the queue so fast. I mean, it is only June. There was talk in April of it being September before the 25-year-olds would be vaccinated. So I am really thrilled to see this, and I'm really thrilled, and I've seen it in my own area. There's a, there's a pop-up vaccine clinic, and it's got queues around the block. It's really delightful, and you could, there's, there's no point gainsaying that. And the, if we just go back to The Guardian, Mark, one final thought on, you know, what every element of Cabinet and indeed other Tory MPs who... I mean, we spoke to Steve Baker and, and Mark Harper today, that pressure from the Conservative backbenchers uh, to get this Freedom Day. The suggestion from the Treasury seemed to be that Rishi Sunak would prefer a cleaner and clearer separation than a, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll have Freedom Day, but you've still got to wear a mask and all that sort of stuff. I mean, is that your understanding of where the argument is? Do you, do you have a compromise? Do you have a fudge? Or do you say, right, two weeks, four weeks, it's, it's delayed? Well, I think as we've seen throughout this kind of phased process of unlocking at each different stage, this has been a, you know, it, it, it's a balanced process. The whole point is that as we, as we were all learning this jargon uh, a year and a bit ago, the idea that you've got to some degree an R budget, as it were, there are some things that you can do. And I think, um, you know, from the, from the Treasury's point of view, for example, um, I, uh, there's a bit of a false dichotomy, the idea that it's either lockdown or protect the economy. The fact is that, letting this thing get out of control um, 
you know, e e even worse or again, um, you know, that's bad for the economy in, in itself, for obvious reasons, because you end up then having to take more severe measures further down the line. But, you know, perfectly justifiably, people are saying, well, given the, exactly as Zoe just said, the pain that people have suffered, the, the huge impact in terms of uh, on, on people's jobs, on people's mental health, in terms of children's education. Um, and of course, the, the in, in pure cash terms, a huge amount of money that's been thrown at, uh, at, at trying to get everybody through this crisis for perfectly justifiable reasons. People are going to keep looking and say, well, actually, is there an opportunity to anything, at least to try to alleviate some of those impacts earlier and to try to get at least to, to, to reap at least some benefit from the, the vaccine rollout. And that really is why it's so heartening to see all this nonsense that some people have been saying for months that the young wouldn't be interested in vaccines or they, they're going to have to be bribed with stickers on Tinder or whatever, whatever it might be. The fact is that people, uh, young people, just like anybody else, want this vaccine to protect themselves and to protect others and to help all of us get out of this. And that ultimately, even with the, the, the Delta variant, um, getting vaccinations done uh, in large numbers as soon as possible is the way to get past that. No, we want the lotteries that some US states are offering, don't we? We want a bit more than a sticker, I have to say. Um, Zoe, we're going we're gonna to park that for now. No doubt we will have lots in the coming days on that. Uh, everyone's watching and waiting, certainly. But let's go to the Metro. Uh, you're tricked. Um, OCG, as we all know from Line of Duty fan groups, um, the organised crime groups have, have had it, haven't they? What a story. It is an extraordinary story, and I sort of suspect them of having waited until they had a huge tranche of successes before they actually busted the ring. Because when you look at the amount they got, you know, the amount of money that was seized, the amount of cocaine that was seized, the amount of cheer, tra cheer criminal transaction that was both halted and caught red-handed, you do think this is an extraordinary achievement. Um, Obviously, like anything, this is it's going to be some days before we know exactly who's been arrested. And I think this story is going to get more and more exciting as you can trace the separate organised crime gangs back to areas that you might know a bit more about. Yes, and actually owning an encrypted app um, puts them in fear of all future apps they might use for that purpose, don't they, uh, the criminals? Um, fascinating stuff, anyway. Front page of the Metro there. Uh, thank you for now. Plenty more still to come, including the perils of upsetting your builder. We will pitch through the rubble of that after the break. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me now are The Guardian columnist Zoe Williams and the chief executive of Conservative Home, Mark Wallace. Welcome back to both of you. Um, let's go to a story which is making the front pages of both the Daily Mail and the Times, uh, which is that students at Magdalen College, Oxford, have decided to remove a picture of uh, the Queen and Gavin Williamson, Mark, has stepped in. Yes, and this, this is yet another one of those kind of eye-rolling stories of um, uh, somewhat ludicrous uh, excess at various different universities, in this case, Magdalen College, Oxford. But it strikes me, when you see these stories, it used to be the case that we'd all kind of roll our eyes and shake our heads about it and say, oh, well, you know, these, these kind of attitudes to life won't survive contact with the real world in a real workplace but actually that's turned out to be completely wrong and what we've seen is that um the student union uh absurd politics like this have graduated into the real world and it turns out that quite a lot of workplaces um even some publishers dare I say even some newspapers have um, have fallen victim to the idea that you, you set what's acceptable by the standard of who in the room is most easily offended which is why I think it does matter uh, interestingly, the president of Magdalen College, Zoe, has um, done a great stream of tweets about this, suggesting that these graduate students a few years ago had actually bought this print of a photo of the Queen. Um, they vote to put it up, they voted to put it down, they fully encourage free speech and political debate and the right to uh, these graduate students' autonomy. Um, meanwhile, the photo will be safely stored. They might vote to put it up again. Maybe they won't. Uh, being a student is about more than studying. It's about exploring and debating ideas. It's sometimes about provoking the older generation. Looks like that isn't so hard to do these days, she has said. It's also, I mean, if you think about it, it's what has always happened in student unions. It, it, I mean, it is an exercise in your nascent democratic agency and people have debates. And there, I, I doubt there's ever been a debate 
won or lost in any student union ever that a 45 year old passing it would look at and say, yes, I really think this was an important thing and the right outcome has been set. You know, the, it is an exercise in democratic engagement. What I find worrying is nothing to do with the students and nothing to do with the Queen. What I find worrying is that Gavin Williamson would have time to weigh in on this when apparently he doesn't have time to actually sort out A-level results, sort out GCSE results, sort out catch-up schooling, engage honestly with teachers' unions. He doesn't actually have time to be education secretary, but he has time to worry about what the students of one college, bear in mind, this is one college in one <laughs> university, and he's busied himself having a view on it. This is an education minister with an unbelievably trivial sensibility. And I really think we should be more worried about that than we are. OK, well, the graduates, uh, The Times tells us, aim to replace the portrait with art by or of other influential and inspirational people. I just hope they let us know who. Um, you've got 20 seconds, Mark. Metro, Extension Rebellion, um, a, a, de a demolition story. Tell us more. No, I, I should say, I hope they replace it with a portrait of Zoe Williams, obviously. But, you know, <laughs> firstly, this particular headline, Extension Rebellion, what a great work. This, um, it's only one side of the story, but allegedly this homeowner um, refused to pay an extra bill from his builder who decided to wreak vengeance with a digger by ripping off the new roof and ripping a huge hole in the extension he'd built and um, leaving the chap to come home to find he had half a house. Oh, dear. Talk more about that, perhaps. We will see you very soon. Top of the 11. Can't wait. Uh, Zoe, Mark, thank you both very much indeed for now. Let's take a look at the weather.